Bo has one word that can be translated in a lot of ways. Sukha. Everything from ease and pleasure, to happiness, well-being, bliss. And the whole purpose of the teaching is to find true happiness. In other words, to take your desire for happiness seriously. You have to ask yourself, are the ways you look for happiness giving you true satisfaction? And if the answer is no, then you're ready to practice. Now part of the mind will say, yes, I'm satisfied. It was good enough for me. And so there's going to be a, a battle inside. But you have to realize, when the Buddha is talking about the bad signs of certain kinds of pleasure, it's not because he's down on pleasure. It's because he wants you to raise your sights higher. As he says, the aggregates have their pain. The aggregates of form, feeling, perception, fabrication, and consciousness. The things out of which we create our sense of self have their pain, but they also have their pleasures. He says it's because of their pleasures that we get stuck on them. It's because of their pain that we look for a way out. So when you find yourself missing a particular pleasure, you have to focus back on the, the drawbacks of that pleasure, which may seem harsh. But again, are you serious about your happiness? Do you really want to be happy? As he said, it's through our experience of suffering or stress. Dukkha, like sukha, has lots of meaning. Suffering, stress, pain. Do we get the conviction to practice? So we have to learn how to focus on the downsides of our old, our old friends, the pleasures we had once and part of the mind would like to go back to again. I see that they really don't measure up. Now, sometimes this is hard when your meditation is not going well. It seems like anything is better than where you are right now. There's a passage in the canon where a monk is in the forest and his meditation is not going very well. And off in the distance he hears the sound of a village festival. He tells himself, oh, those people, they know how to have, find happiness. Nadeva comes to see him. He says, do you realize how many people envy you here practicing? You're following the path that leads out. And most people in the world are following a path that doesn't lead anywhere in particular. Or if it does, it tends to lead down to unskillful things, and from unskillful things, unhappy consequences. And so the monk came to his senses. It's interesting that there's a similar story in John Mahabo's account of his own practice. He was in the forest one night, and off in the distance he heard a village festival. And again, it was during a time when his own meditation was not going well. In this case, he doesn't say that a deva appeared to him, but he was able to come back to his senses. Thinking about the people in the past, those who found true happiness, the Buddha, his noble disciples. They were noble not only in the fact that they did admirable things, but they also found a noble happiness. And it's noble in the sense that it really is worth it. So when you think of happy people in the world, think of them. As for unhappy people, you, can, you don't have to search very far. They're all around us. But there are people who like to put a good face on things. Years back, when I first came back to the States, John Sawat and I were riding in a plane coming back from Texas. And the third guy in the row sized us up immediately. You could tell that we we're Buddhist monks. And before he even said hi, he said, you know, I don't have any suffering in my life. He'd probably heard the Buddha talked about how life was suffering. 
Well, the Buddha didn't say that life was suffering. But anyway, the guy started on how he wasn't suffering. Then he told us about his life, and it sounded pretty miserable. He lived in Blythe, which is bad enough. He had his son who was in jail. He had a daughter who'd gotten involved with a junkie and had a cocaine kid and couldn't raise it, and so the grandparents had to raise it. The kid was very sickly. He kept on insisting that he wasn't suffering at all. It's that kind of thinking that allows people to bear up with what they've got, but it also keeps them trapped. And we're on a path that releases us from the trap. So when you think of the pleasures that will pull you away, think of the peanut butter that we put in the have a heart trap. It pulls you in and then it's up. You're stuck. This is a life in which people are not stuck. This is a path in which we're not stuck. It's a path that leads out. And so it's through our experience of having suffered that we should try to keep nurturing our conviction that there really is a way out and this is it. So we don't let ourselves get pulled back so easily by our memories of old pleasures, old friends. As I said today, John Fung would often say what I, what I mentioned this afternoon, if your past pleasures, if they really were that good, they'd still be here. They wouldn't have left you. And as for the things that we pine for, that we would really like to ha have in this lifetime, the, the sensual pleasures, he said, tell yourself, remind yourself that you already had them. That's why you long for them again. You want them back. Now think about that. You'll get them again, but then you'll lose them again. And you want them again. And you do whatever you can to get them back. And it doesn't end. That, he said, if you think about it, is enough to give rise to a sense of sangwega, the desire to get out of this. And there's that similar reflection in the canon. The Buddha said, you see someone who's enjoying all kinds of fame and wealth and beauty, popularity, whatever. Remind yourself, you've been there. But at the same time, if you see somebody who's really poor and miserable, not enough to eat, sick, not able to get any medicine, you've been there too. And the two are tied to each other. Because as King Pasendi noted, when people get wealthy and happy, they tend to get really careless and do things that will pull them down. And you have to ask yourself, do you want to stay there? Do you want to keep going back to that again and again and again? Back and forth, back and forth going nowhere at all? Or do you want to go someplace, someplace that is a happiness that doesn't disappoint? Unfortunately for, for us as we're practicing, it's, it's, a, it's a word we've heard, it's news we've heard. But it's not yet anything tangible in our hands or tangible in the mind. Still, the people who teach this are reliable. And you ask yourself, are your old pleasures, are your old friends reliable? Can you really trust them? How many times do you want to be let down again? Or do you seriously want to be happy? Seriously happy. The possibility is there, and it's open to us right now. So if you find yourself flagging, learn how to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep on going.
And a large part of it is learning to see the flip side of all your old pleasures. It may seem harsh, because after all, we tend to identify ourselves with the way we've found pleasure in the past. That's the kind of person we are. When people put out personal ads, they, it's always about how they like to find happiness. That's how I d they identify who they are. So it's digging into a lot of the ways you identify yourself. This is one of the reasons why it's good to look at the mind as a committee, or as a corporation. There are lots of yous in there. You have to figure out which ones you can trust and which ones you can't. But learning how to step back from all the different voices in your mind helps you look at them with a little bit more objectivity and be willing to see the drawbacks of the old ways that you've found happiness or pleasure or ease, well-being, or bliss in life. And remind yourself that there is something better. So that you want to stick with the path. It's all a matter of training our desires and pointing them in the right direction. <laughs>